Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Jana Hexter. I'm with the Northeastern IPM Center, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. It's actually a nicer environment on, online. It's a very wet and rainy kind of day here in Ithaca um, this morning. So I am delighted to start this uh, presentation of non-traditional areas for IPM careers and the associated challenges for two as LGBTQIA plus individuals in pursuing them with Ryan Gott. And if you could um, move to the next slide, that would be wonderful. All right, so there is live tr transcription available, which um, you can click on um, if you would like to enable that for yourself. A recording of this webinar is, is going to be available within a week at the following link. You don't have to write that link down. I will send you an email when it's ready um, with a link and you can watch it as many times as, as you like. And uh, anyone who is registered will receive a copy of that email. But um, if you have questions, let me know. Next slide, please. We love your questions and uh, we do have um, a Q&A break, two Q&A breaks in this presentation. So what makes it easier for us um, on our end is if you do not put them in the chat, but put them in the Q&A feature. So if you scroll over, you'll see a black bar that will um, appear above or below your screen. And in there, there should be a box that says Q&A with two like little rectangles. If you click on that, you can ask a question and you can do so anonymously. And uh, when we get a break, I will ask those questions of Ryan. And um, and, uh, and that would it helps us because we often get the similar questions or the same question, and then I can mark them as checked um, as we go through. And the next slide, please. So it is my delight and pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ryan Gott. And uh, he is currently a fellow at Longwood Gardens in the Fellows Program. His background as a plant health specialist working in IPM and quality control in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in the medical cannabis industry, and as the associate director of IPM at Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens, also in Pittsburgh. Ryan is also an avid educator, having taught for over 11 years in settings from formal college classrooms to public science festivals. Ryan's an enthusiastic advocate for sustainable landscaping and has a particular interest in Eastern North American native plants. He received his bachelor's degree in biology from Purdue University and his doctorate degree in entomology from the University of Maryland. And it is a delight to have you here today, Ryan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yana. Okay. And uh, we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, there are no right and wrong answers to this, but you should see a poll pop up on your screen. It gives uh, Ryan a sense of who is here and uh, levels of interest and knowledge so that he can tailor the presentation for you. And I will be quiet uh, while you answer these four questions. If you don't see it, um, sometimes iPads have problems, I think, um, popping up the screen. So don't worry about it if you're online and you, you just don't see it. And I'll be quiet for a moment while that happens. All right, and I'll share the results with you. Uh, there we go. Um, so how knowledgeable are you about the breadth of careers? Um, we've got somewhat moderately and a few people who are very knowledgeable. Um, how knowledgeable are you about the challenges uh, follow, um, facing the 2SLGBTQIA plus community and pursuing careers? And um, almost half of the people are not at all knowledgeable. And uh, you add that in with somewhat knowledgeable. Um, that is the majority of people in that end of the spectrum. Um, and currently, how likely are you to take into account the needs of S, uh, two SLGBTQIA community members when you're designing research programs? And the preponderance of people that is somewhat likely and moderately likely. And, um, and so hopefully that might change uh, if the result of this uh, presentation. And um, how familiar are you with your DEIJ statement or policy at your institution? 50% of people are very familiar and then everybody else falls below that in, on the range. So, um, so with that, um, I will invite um, uh, Ryan to dive into his presentation. And just a reminder, if you've come in a little late, if you have a question, if you can pop it in the Q&A feature, that would be wonderful. And I'll monitor that. Off you go, Ryan. 
All right, thank you so much, Yana. Um, and thank you all for being here and for taking that poll. Um, it, it, the poll uh, that sort of told me there's both, you know, room for improvement in a lot of the, the areas we're gonna talk about today, but also uh, it was also very encouraging because I think it sounded like people wanted to know more. Um, and so I think that, you know, that is very, hopeful, which I think we need a lot more of these days. Um, and so I just want to say, you know, first, thank you all for being here um, to attend uh, this talk. Um, as Yana said, uh, my name is Ryan Gott. I'm here uh, to present to you on non-traditional areas for IPM careers and the associated challenges for 2SLGBTQIA plus individuals in pursuing them. Um, so I wanted to start this talk first with a land acknowledgement. Um, for where I am delivering this talk from in the Philadelphia region. Um, this is uh, something I pulled together uh, based on uh, the land acknowledgement uh, from Farm Philly, uh, another nonprofit in the Philadelphia area. So I'm just going to read through this uh, so we can really um, properly do this acknowledgement and really you know, absorb this. For centuries, the land now known as the greater Philadelphia region was home to and cared for by native peoples. These include the Lenny Lenape people of Lenape Hawking and the Patoxic of Delaware Bay. We recognize these tribes' strength and history of resistance to colonization. We know that our modern systems of growing food and owning property are built on the stolen land of indigenous people, the enslavement of African peoples, and the genocide of both native and black communities and cultures. These violent acts continue to impact black and indigenous communities today. We must understand and name these realities. We must acknowledge how they influence who has power over land and food in the Philadelphia region. Black and indigenous communities have deep knowledge and innovation in agriculture, science, technology, and land stewardship, but have been ignored or erased in the documentation of the collective knowledge in these and other areas. We must call on one another to work to right these historic and ongoing injustices. All right, and with that, um, Jan already did a, a wonderful introduction for me. I wanted to put a little bit more uh, out there uh, about who I am. Um, I'm basically I'm basically just a nature nerd. I like to go outside, do things outside, and think about the system that is our world and all of its nestedness and connection. Um, that is where I really you know like to thrive. Um, I've been doing this in my career uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, as Yana said, both in botanical gardens at Phipps Conservatory and in the uh, for-profit cannabis industry at Mitre Genetics. Um, I'm currently re-entering the world of nonprofit public gardens uh, through the Longwood Fellows Program at Longwood Gardens, which is where I'm uh, presenting to you today. So our time today um, is gonna be spent on the two parts uh, that are mentioned in the title for our for this talk. The first is on just a little bit of the slightly more non-traditional areas uh, for IPM careers that that I have been exploring um, through public gardens and the cannabis industry. Um, you know, one is an existing sort of institution that does do IPM, but doesn't always necessarily get uh, as often talked about or explored by folks when looking for careers. Um, and then, of course, the cannabis, the legal cannabis industry. Uh, is brand new um, and doesn't even exist yet in some states. So that's gonna be a brand new sort of frontier for career possibilities. The second part of the talk is going to uh, associate pursuing those kinds of careers and really all IPM careers um, and the challenges for pursuing those for uh, the 2S LGBTQIA community. Um, the barriers, um, why that can be more difficult, um, and not even just IPM careers, uh, but for various other reasons we'll, we'll talk about uh, across many careers, um, and a little bit about what more can be done to support members of the community. So first, uh, we're going to jump into uh, our IPM careers section here. So this sort of wheel encompasses, I feel, um, a lot of areas that that do IPM sort of work that you could find careers. And this is definitely not exhaustive at all. You can see that you can find plenty of things in here. I, I see it all the time and think I should update it, but then think about what a pain that would be. So I don't, um, but there IPM fits on all these 
uh, various areas in many different ways. Um, typically, um, what we hear about the most in, in most of our world are um, the academic uh, sort of jobs in IPM, whether that is research or an extension position, um, and as, as well as industry uh, research, typically, you know, agrochemical uh, type research. Um, and then governmental uh, research or, or activities and, and things like forestry and agriculture um, at federal and state levels. But what I'm going to talk about today is how I have explored IPM in a couple of the places, one place that is not, is not uh, expressed as, as often as it could be uh, in the world of nonprofits, specifically about public gardens. And then I'm going to talk about my experience in, yes, industry, where we definitely talk about IPM, but in, in other ways, um, and, and just talking about my experience doing it in really the brand new field of the cannabis industry. So uh, starting with gardens, um, if you're not familiar with public gardens, I wanted to just present to you um, how the American Public Gardens Association, or APGA, defines a public garden. Um, so a public garden is an institution that maintains collections of plants for the purposes of public education and enjoyment, in addition to research, conservation, and higher learning. A public garden must be open to the public, and the garden's resources and accommodations must be made to all visitors. Um, so that is, that is the framework uh, that APGA sort of operates uh, for the definition of a public garden. Um, and many of you who may be uh, attending today from universities, may have a, a public garden of some form on your campus. Many, many universities house uh, a garden or an arboretum um, that may be integrated into campus or perhaps a separate site, um, but that uh, often um, are considered public gardens and, and pursue these same kinds of functions. So this talk today is really gonna be very experiential based on what I have done. Um, so my experience in a garden uh, began as uh, the Associate Director of Integrated Pest Management at Phipps Conservatory in Pittsburgh. Um, so this was, I uh, basically oversaw all the aspects of plant health um, on our 13 acre sites, both indoor and outdoor. We had 14 glass conservatory rooms, each filled with a completely different palette of plants. Uh, we had eight greenhouse ranges where we were producing uh, both uh, plants for shows, food crops, and maintaining really important collections of plants. Um, and then also overseeing the IPM in three office buildings, three kitchens, and two classrooms. So there's really just a big mix of not only the plant IPM side, but learning and engaging and also urban and structural IPM. So it was, it was very expansive. Coming from an entomology background, there was, there was much more to learn in thinking about, you know, oh, I have to now suddenly think about what are our tactics for keeping deer out of places, so something I'd never thought about before, and groundhogs, and things I had not experienced pr prior to this. Um, so it was a really wonderful sort of expansive experience. Um, in my role, I had sort of dotted lines of management working with my, you know, fellow horticultural staff. Um, that, that is typically the experience of IPM in gardens. You, you really, it is about collaboration and working uh, with the folks who you can help identify problems, um, and prescribe solutions and, and guide them through or train them in how to do those things. And they're really the ones uh, oftentimes applying uh, those certain kinds of solutions. So for example, at FIPS, um, you know, both horticulture staff as well as the volunteers I worked with, they'd be engaging in a lot of the daily um, sort of physical management of things. But there's a plant that needed to be, you know, sprayed off daily because of aphids or um, uh, having a, special collection plant that was having an issue that I needed a volunteer to sort of spend a lot of time manually cleaning that plant. Um, that, that was all of that sort of uh, diffused responsibilities involved in, in IPM. And then just following up and seeing how things are going. Um, and there's also a lot of training to deliver across departments and, and gardens. As you can probably guess, because I'm sure it's the same in all of your institutions, uh, everything is, is very much connected together. You can't you can't think about what are we our practices in this garden room and think of that as somehow completely separate from what's going on in, let's say, your catering kitchen. Those two things are going to feed into one another because, you know, a 
an ant or a, a mouse or a bird or something doesn't see those divisions. Your, your IPM has to think about the everything functioning as a system as, and as a whole. Uh, so this is the, the site I was working in. Um, this is some, an aerial photo of uh, sort of the back lower campus of SIPS. Um, SIPS is also home to uh, still some of the greenest and most sustainable buildings in the world. Um, they have buildings that are platinum lead certified, that are well beings, which is about the people working in the buildings. Uh, they are living buildings, which is about the surrounding environment and, and how uh, these buildings actually benefit their surrounding environment. Um, so these, these very impressive structures um, that you really have to adapt your IPM uh, according to what you can do in there. A lot of traditional chemical management um, that, that may be the go-to for taking care of um, structures or, or urban pest problems are no longer options when you are dealing with buildings that are considering the health of the people inside, the environment outside, and have a lot of those kinds of restrictions going on. So it makes for a very unique um, challenging and fun environment to be uh, exploring IPM in. Uh, these are some of, uh, you know, I mentioned the extreme diversity of plants and therefore IPM challenges that we dealt with all over uh, in the garden. Uh, we're, you know, producing both food plants like this hydroponic lettuce as used uh, in uh, the, the restaurant on site. Uh, the bottom two pictures show collections. Uh, we have, there's a very important collection of orchids and specifically uh, the lady slipper group of or orchids uh, at FIP. So it's very important to maintain the health of that collection. Um, there's also a, a, a large bonsai collection you see in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and then there's the houses uh, like you see in the upper right hand corner where we have a huge diversity of plants that are brought in and out uh, to the display room uh, for, for the guests to enjoy. And so you have all of these plants in very close proximity to one another. And so you have to think of a lot of them have unique issues. Some of them have issues that you have to worry about spilling over into other plants when you have very uh, general, uh, generalist herbivore pests. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a, again, a complicated and very much interconnected system that you're always dealing with. Um, and these are just the greenhouses. So then you move into our actual display houses. Um, and you have everything from being on the ground floor with ferns and cycads, like you see in the bottom left-hand corner, to you know over a hundred feet into the air of tropical trees, like in the tropical forest room in the top left, um, or in the palm court, uh, the the tallest of the houses uh, at the, in the bottom right, and thinking about what is going on hundreds of feet in the air at the top of these palm trees, as well as in the soil and, and uh, around them down at the ground floor. So you have to, there's, there's a, just a big variety of, of uh, potential issues and opportunities that come up uh, in these systems. Um, but what I wanna really emphasize about IPM careers in a public garden is that you also, because you're in a nonprofit public garden, get the chance to engage in so much more than just doing and applying IPM or plant healthcare. Um, I was able to continue pursuing uh, things that I love, such as education. I've, I've been teaching since 2009 when I was an, an, an undergraduate myself, um, and I was able to engage in all kinds of adult education, helping develop kids camps. Um, the live butterfly exhibit uh, fell under me. I, I ran that and came up with new interpretive signage for it. Um, I gave uh, talks uh, that help you know, people gain acc accreditation for various kinds of licensure, um, pesticide applicator certification, um, a lot of just public outreach, interacting with the media, doing interviews, um, and just developing partnerships and helping so many other organizations around Pittsburgh, which I showed just a few of them on this slide um, from, from uh, societies uh, like the Orchid Society of Western Pennsylvania um, to other, uh, to uh, universities like University of Pittsburgh and, and helping some of their students in sustainability efforts that they were undertaking. Uh, Pittsburgh Zoo, Job Corps uh, that has a location in Pittsburgh. You get to do so much more than IPM. And so I think it's, it's a great opportunity to continue to learn and expand, um, especially if, you know, like myself, coming from just an entomology background, it was, it was it's very fulfilling um, to get to do and explore and contribute so much more towards the mission when working in a nonprofit.
Um, this is just some of, uh, pictures of some of these, you know, educational opportunities I was able to undertake. Um, you know, tabling and, and your know, general public outreach about entomology and other aspects of science, like in the upper left-hand corner, um, a lot about pollinators, as you can imagine, being at a public garden. Um, did a lot of uh, certification for pollinator-friendly gardens through the Penn State Master Gardeners, like you see that sign in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, we put together uh, exhibits and things that talk about pollinators in our uh, children's garden that you see in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, and then just many, many classes uh, that I was able to develop and, and teach like in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, which was a diagnosing plant problems course that is part of a, a larger uh, certificate program that FIPS runs. So after uh, my, my time um, at FIPS, I, I, I really wanted to get a, an, a, a bigger view on the possibilities of working in IPM. Um, and that's when an opportunity came around uh, to pivot uh, and spend some time learning uh, IPM, uh, plant healthcare and quality control in the for-profit cannabis industry, also um, it, luckily right in Pittsburgh. Um, this was where IPM really took on an even new heightened sense of importance uh, because you're now working with this plant product that is being regulated as medicine. Um, here in Pennsylvania, we do we only have a medical cannabis industry. There is no adult use or recreational industry. Um, so there, there are really high standards for, the, for this product. Um, and you want to exceed those standards for your customers because they are patients expecting a medicine um, to help them with, with certain problems. Um, and so it really takes a very strong system thinking approach um, to think about everything going on uh, where uh, in your growing facility, to think about all the processes and people inside and outside uh, that may affect the quality growth of your plant. Um, and, and so it was a, this was a, the uh, diagram you here see uh, from Surendra Dara uh, developed in 2019, this new paradigm for integrated pest management, which I just love what he developed here and it's, it's a fabulous paper if you haven't read it um and i think he even put out a, a small update to it recently um and it really this diagram really uh brings into focus that that kind of thinking that it's not just you know traditionally we thought about it's the pest management knowledge and resources and your planning but elevating out all those extra levels of what does the consumer expect? What does uh, people who are buying our product to resell it expect? Um, what are the effects of people's, um, the, the, the social acceptability of what we're doing with the plant? Um, you know, that, that's an extra layer beyond even just government regulation of you may be allowed to do this, but is it acceptable to people to do a certain action? Um, so there's up and down the ladder that all these aspects of the system to integrate in here. Um, there's a lot of challenges in this. Um, you know, the, the industry is still very young in Pennsylvania. Um, it's certainly older in, in states like Colorado and California. And there's plenty of states that don't have any kind of industry yet um, and maybe have begun uh, growing hemp, but are not in any of, uh, are not yet into the uh, marijuana cannabis industry. Um, some of these challenges include the product, uh, like I said, being regulated as medicine. It is highly inspected and tested as it should be because people are, are you know, in, ingesting this as, as medicine. Um, and it's not just by the state. When, you, when people are buying your product, it is highly inspected by the patient, by the customer. Um, and you, you will hear back if, if they think something is off about a product that they have purchased. Um, you know, they, they are expecting very high quality and safe product. Um, and, and uh, that ties into uh, sort of the, the next challenge, um, which again, in my experience in Pennsylvania, almost all the traditional chemical methods you may think for um, incorporating into an IPM program or as sort of your fail safe, you know, app spray application to manage certain common pests are not available to use in marijuana cannabis in Pennsylvania. It's extremely restricted in what you can use on these plants um, in order to avoid any kind of spillover or effects downstream on the patient. Um, and so you're really relying almost solely on the synergy between all the other kinds of tactics, management tactics that you can undertake. Um, and you, you don't have 
really a fallback of a chemical spray to use um, because if you try to spray something it's, and it's just a little too late in the lifespan of that product and it gets harvested and tested and it tests positive for residue of a pesticide, you might lose millions of dollars in product um, and, and you know, huge potential losses. So you have, to be, you have to be very careful and very intentional about um, the tactics you use the entire lifespan of the plant um, and thinking of not just the, you know, the traditional management tactics we think of, but again, thinking of the system, um, how people are working in or even moving past the areas where the plants are. Um, to to really have that that broader biosecurity sort of mindset and everything going on with these plants. Um, restrictions um, on what can be used in cannabis also vary greatly state by state because there is no um, you know federal level regulation or, or um, recommendations on any of this. Um, so advice can also be hard to seek because someone may say, oh yeah, we just use this at this time and it it always helps us. And I'd say. Well, that, that is absolutely not an option for me in Pennsylvania. Um, and so it's, it's really being inventive, thinking on your feet and, and rising to these challenges. Um, another part of the challenge is, you know, this is the, the legal cannabis industry is new, but cannabis is not. It has been grown for a very long time. There's a lot of people out there who are very knowledgeable about these plants and how to grow them from their past, uh, you know, black market or illegal experience. Um, but there's, that also means that along with that great amount of knowledge, there can there's also opportunities for false information out there um, where there's simply not the expertise level there um, and people are giving advice uh, that may end up not being correct. Um, so this is uh, when doing research online, you come across a lot of this, typically on online forums and people are talking about their plants. Um, for example, I found this, um, someone posted this photo, wanted advice, Someone told them, oh, well, those are thrips. You can tell because of the black poop they leave behind. Spray this. Um, these are, of course, not thrips. These are caterpillars and they're dry, uh, they're dry excrement left behind, um, not sort of the shiny wet drops we would think of associated with thrips. Um, and what they were recommending spraying all over on, on these plants was actually a product that wasn't going to do much of anything to a caterpillar. Um, and so you have somebody needlessly applying a pesticide onto a plant that they're probably planning on consuming in some way. Um, additionally, um, you know, I was very interested in, in mealybugs and their association with indoor grown cannabis um, while trying to find information on this. Um, I went down a very long rabbit hole where somebody was talking about mealybugs on cannabis and found it all deriving from this claim about mealybugs on cannabis when it was coming, when this is actually a photo of cottony cushion scale on a stem of, from a citrus tree. Um, and from there, it just propagated out of people saying, oh yeah, this and this and this kind of mealybug can be on cannabis. And I couldn't substantiate any of it because it's all derived from this one false post on the internet. Um, so it's, you're also sometimes developing a lot of information on your own. Um, and here, I also wanna emphasize how much IPM can branch into um, other career paths within the cannabis industry. Um, so I was engaging in a lot of these things and you can easily see routes where you can begin specializing in these things. Um, and you may even end up not even doing IPM. Um, there's of course the overall aspects of plant healthcare, but there's also tons of education and training, um, you know, internally for staff on safety and processes and operations, biosecurity, policy and compliance is huge. Uh, you know, everything I was doing had, had associated state laws that we had to be compliant with. Um, safety, quality management, even research and development. We did a lot of small research projects to create the knowledge because there simply wasn't any for us to draw from. Um, and you can also, you know, take all of that and begin even your own consulting uh, uh, companies, you know, based around IPM for cannabis um, because there's not a whole lot of that expertise out there. Um, so where am I now? Um, going back into public gardens, um, I want to get back to the, just that, that larger natural system connection. Um, so I'm at Longwood Gardens in the Fellows Program, um, which is you know, actually going to ele hopefully elevate me out of doing IPM um, into more leadership type roles in gardens um, so that uh, 
I can think of that bigger system in gardens and how IPM may play a, still play a role within the larger goals of an organization. Um, so IPM can really take you anywhere you want to go is really the emphasis I want to make here. You know, I, I came out of just, you know, being the person at a place who would go and spray pesticides to now pursuing a career to try to become a director, VP, CEO of these important nonprofit institutions in my community. So IPM careers can really branch out and take you anywhere you want to go. And that's, you know, that's, that's the emphasis I want to leave you with here. Um, now, Yana, I know that we're going to do a review and see if there's any questions that have come in. There are not any questions uh, that come in, but I actually had a question. Um, and um, I was interested when you were saying uh, about the, the structures um, at FIPS, where they have the certification and um, and looking at you know structural IPM with that, I'm I'm kind of curious. Are there guidelines um, around that for IPM, or is it something you have to you have to develop and think through yourself? Um, yeah, each each of those kinds of the, there's many many certifications you can get for green and sustainable or or regenerative buildings now, um, mm -hmm. and they typically always have some kind of section that is about um, either like allowable chemicals, like chemical use in the facility. Sometimes, um, sometimes there are specific pest management uh, sections in their certification guide. Um, so it really depends on the certification, but there's usually something in there that, that addresses it at least tangentially. Um, and sometimes they'll say like, you know, you can't use any products that appear on this kind of list from the EPA, or, you know, they'll reference something um, that does impose, you know, additional restrictions on what you can do, what you can apply, even the physical products you might want to use, um, you know, I don't know, various kinds of like excluders for rodents or, uh, you know, other kinds of physical products. Um, you'll have to still, even for many of these certifications, review those and see if they have been produced with any kinds of red list chemicals that, you know, may have had negative effects on the people in the places where they were being produced, um, if they have anything that it may off gas and affect the people working around them. Um, so that affected us a lot, you know, in doing sealing of cracks and, and crevices where ants and things are coming through. You couldn't just grab any old sealant because it may be reduce, uh, producing toxic uh, VOCs that are not allowed within, you know, the, the, the certification of that building. Um, so it really, it, it, it does end up touching basically all aspects of your IPM and you just have to think creatively and be agile uh, and, you know, come up with new solutions about uh, how to accomplish the, the, that ultimate goal you're going for in your program. Thank you. That's, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that before. So yeah. great. Wonderful. Well, I'm sure if you have other questions, we can pop them in and we have another uh, break for questions further along, but if you'd like to continue for the other half of the presentation, that'd be wonderful. Sure. Okay, so part two here um, is considering uh, the 2S LGBTQIA plus community in IPM careers. So in this part here, I wanna first provide some clarity and a disclaimer about you know, what, what we'll be discussing. Um, first, a couple you know, points of clarity, um, if, if you're not familiar with certain terms. Um, so first is what is 2S LGBTQIA+, um, where from here on, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll often be saying the community or members of the community. Um, so that, that is it's an expansion on what you may be familiar with seeing, which is just that LGBT or LGBTQ. Um, I think the part that people are most often unfamiliar with is that 2S at the beginning, uh, that stands for two spirit. Um, that is um, that is an, an identity in certain, uh, but not all, um, indigenous cultures, um, and only only members of that culture um, can identify as two spirit. You know, I I am not any member of an indigenous community. I cannot identify as two spirit. I simply cannot. Um, the the LGBTQ I think most people are familiar with um, lesbian gay bisexual transgender queer or sometimes questioning um, I uh, is in, is intersex A is asexual or agender um, 
But we know that there are also many other identities um, that come under this umbrella, which is what that plus represents. Um, there, there's semisexual, gray sexual, um, other, other areas along the gender spectrum that are still all included within the community. Um, so this is simply a slightly expanded, more inclusive um, you know, set of letters to describe the community. Um, the next point of clarity is what is intersectionality? Um, that we may mention along the way, or maybe some questions about. So intersectionality is simply the recognition that people who hold multiple kinds of, of identities may experience and may experience things differently or have different experiences through life um, because of the, the intersection or the interaction, the combination of their identities. Um, so this is, you know, this is why a, um, let's say a, uh, a, a black, uh, straight, cisgender male has certain experiences, a, while a, a black, gay, cisgender male has a different set of experiences because now there's that intersection between um, you know being being a black man or person of color and being gay and how those two things intersect with one another and create a different set of experiences um, and so you know I I as as a personal example I also can't really claim an experience um, that will have derived from uh, intersectionality within myself. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a gay man, but I am cisgendered, able-bodied, neurotypical, um, and white. Um, and so they're, they're, those are all the, you know, for, you know, good or bad or whatever, um, the sort of cultural norm within the United States. And so there, there are not going to be negative experiences associated with those things. In fact, they give me privilege of many different kinds. And so intersectionality is recognizing that those multiple identities interact uh, with one another in different ways for those people. Um, now, uh, just the disclaimer on this, um, this story now is gonna contain a lot of my own personal story. Um, and because the entire community is so diverse um, and not, not even one single part of that community is, is even homogenous, um, my story can't be generalized to others. Nobody's story can be generalized to others because everyone is different, of course. Um, but it's, you know, we often think like, oh, well, if I'm, if I'm gay and I'm talking about that G, I must, this must be true of everybody in that G. And that's absolutely not true. Um, and especially referring back to that intersectionality. There are many people who identify as gay who have other identities who give them completely different experiences. So the disclaimer here is just that I do not and cannot speak for the, our entire extremely diverse community. So getting back to uh, sort of the focus on, on you know, what we were talking about careers here um, and talking about my story, I wanna talk about the real start to my career journey, you know, finishing a PhD in entomology and thinking, okay, you know, I, I really need a job. What am I gonna do? Um, and, you know, I think typically, you know, you know, people say, you know, move, you know, think about what you want, and it's really up to you to, to move wherever the job is, right? You know, we, nowadays, we expect people to move often many times and great distances to pursue their career path. Um, and so you may graduate, so, you know, graduating, people may think, oh, okay, here's the entire map of possibilities for myself, you know, you know, 50 states, and, and that's just staying within the United States, right? Um, so it seems like there should be a lot of options out there. Um, but when I, you know, was thinking about where can I, where can I have a career? Of course, the other consideration is where can I not only just live, but that I will flourish, be able to be myself. And unfortunately, uh, in today's age, also considering, will I survive? Um, there are so many reports you know, from starting long ago, continuing to today, um, I didn't even have time to update this with the recent uh, shooting at Club Q in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, this is the this is the real face of what you know people in the community think about when it's where where can I where can I live and work and thrive and at the same time also just survive. Um, 
And so you look at, the, you have to consider this, this layer, this lens that people, um, you're not even just in, in my community, but what, what is this same kind of lens being applied by people of color, by you know, all, all those different groups out there um, and how this affects how we actually see that map of possibility across the United States. Um, and to pull out another, uh, a, another specific recently published example, um, in the Washington Post just recently, earlier this year, um, they documented the level of anti-trans uh, anti laws, so laws discriminating against, trying to outlaw transgender people in the United States rising precipitously over recent years. Um, and so if you can't imagine uh, having a law being brought up to outlaw who you are as a person and how that affects where you think you can live, survive, thrive, and flourish. Um, so taking this kind of lens, which was my lens looking for where I, you know, need to try to get a job, but also be somewhere that I can flourish, left me thinking about a map of the United States and my possible career steps, looking at something more like this initially. Um, and again, this is, this is my opinion. I don't mean to offend anyone who does not hold those kinds of convictions, who lives in some of the areas that may have disappeared from this map. Um, it, is, it was simply how I was viewing my possibilities. Also, the other set of this reality is where, is where now is actually possible for me to get to. I'm just graduating from grad school. I don't have money. I can't make a very big move. Um, and I was living over there in Maryland. Um, so the map of everywhere that I could really try to look for my next job came down to this, sort of the areas along the East Coast that um, have cities or, or you know, urban centers that I can feel comfortable in living in um, and that were easily accessible to me on an extremely small budget or returning back and trying to find some of the same urban centers in sort of this Midwest area here where I grew up, where I have family and I had a support structure that I could return to. And so then even within that, you know, they were, I was also considering what's more acceptable, less acceptable, just based on my own perceptions and research and, you know, what was going on, closeness to family, um, overall state policies, all of those kinds of lenses. Um, and I, of course, I ended up in Pennsylvania, a place I may have been initially thinking of as maybe, you know, the less acceptable place I might want to go to, but the job ended up being in Pittsburgh, an urban center that I felt I could, you know, really, that I could, felt I could feel comfortable in and safe in. Um, but of course, even Pittsburgh has its problems, just as any city does. But this was just meant to sort of illustrate my process. Um, and applying the lenses I was thinking of in where, where can I actually go to not only work, like I said, but survive and flourish and, and be able to really live my life as myself. Um, and this is not really that uncommon of a story for members of the community. Um, so a lot of the, the data going forward I'm going to talk about uh, is pulled from a 2019 report by the Movement Advancement Project. Um, the, this report uh, was specifically focused on um, the, the community uh, within rural areas and specifically majority rural states. Um, they found that you know, rural areas are definitely more diverse than imagined, more, you know, certainly more diverse than I think the typical stereotypical perception is of rural areas. They do contain diversity. Um, it may just simply be at a, a lower overall level than other areas. Um, but it found that those areas are also less supportive of the community. So those people are there, but they're they're struggling more, and there is less support for them in those in those rural areas. Um, and so that also led to the community members in these areas being more vulnerable to discrimination. Um, and they found within uh, those majority rural states and those rural areas, um, you know that. There, there was a lot of negativity towards the community. Um, and just overall, we have the climate of a, a highly divisive political climate um, in, in the United States. Um, and things that are 
often aggressively negative towards the community, as I pointed out, with increasing number of anti-trans bills, um, some recent, you know, uh, don't say gay type bills, um, all of those kinds of things going on. Um, so pulling a little bit of uh, the, the figures from this, this same movement advancement project uh, report, uh, which you can see the citation down here in the bottom, if you'd like to look that up and give that a read, um, they divided up the United States into these regions um, to simply look at, you know, they wanted to say, where can we talk about rural versus urban? Um, and they went with, uh, they found that the majority of the United States consists of states that themselves consist of majority rural areas, meaning the majority of the population lives in a rural area versus a suburban or urban area. And when I, when I looked at this, it really, this is when it struck me of how much my consideration of where I wanted to live or not was matching up with this map of these majority rural states. Um, and, and that, that, that was, you know, I found this well after I had gone through that kind of thinking process. And so it's just that, that surprised me with how much it did match up with, with their findings on this. So they found, um, in these majority rural states, um, members of the community, um, experienced a lot of aspects of rural life that amplify the impact of, uh, their potential acceptance or rejection and their interaction with their community and trying to live in those rural areas or in those states in general. Um, like I mentioned, there is diversity in these areas, but there are fewer people overall representing that diversity. So there's increased visibility for each person who is openly expressing that diversity. Um, and so you're, it's more, you're more easily singled out and seen as, oh, the one trans woman in town. And it's seen as that, that one thing, you, you are highly visible in that community. Um, rural communities are very tightly knit, um, which is positive in a lot of ways for these communities. Um, but when it comes to the, the 2 SLGBTQIA plus community, um, this means that anything that may happen to them because of their identity, um, whether it's rejection on the negative side or acceptance on the positive side, um, very quickly ripples out into other parts of their life, to other people in their life, um, because it is tightly knit. People talk, um, you know, who, who you see on a social basis is probably who you work with, who you see at church, all of these kinds of things. You know, those are the, the it's a tightly knit community. You see those people all the time. And so there's a bigger impact of that. There's also fewer alternatives for members of the community in these rural areas. Um, if, if they face discrimination, um, the example here was, you know, to like a healthcare provider, um, they, and they, they can't access healthcare there, that may be the only place to get healthcare in their entire town. And so then they have to have access to transportation to potentially drive a fair distance away to just give it another try at a healthcare provider in another town. Um, so that can be a very big burden, especially in rural areas where they are also typically socially uh, or e ec economically disadvantaged. So to have a car and gas and make that drive to try to find someone to just give you health care um, can be a huge burden. They also found in these rural areas, members of the community just had a uh, less of a support structure. Um, the being uh, these rural areas being just more isolated geographically uh, meant that it was harder to find support resources. Um, and, and there was less community to build a supportive community. Um, and when you don't have community, it is harder to endure challenges or discrimination uh, that may occur in any of the areas of life that, that are listed on the right-hand side. The same project also examined the social and political landscape uh, in uh, these majority rural states. Um, they found overall there is a less supportive public opinion uh, for members of the community. People are just less likely to know someone who's a member of the community. Um, there was a little bit of hope there, though, because not only the members who, who do form the diversity in these, in these rural areas, but also younger generations are sort of a base of support. And, and the hope is really that that will keep growing, that these younger generations are kind of bucking that trend and will form a more, uh, a stronger supportive base in these rural areas. Um, they also, uh, this project also found uh, just overall 
fewer legal and policy protections uh, for members of the community. Um, and it was not only that there were fewer uh, protections, you know, on the books for the community, it was also a higher likelihood of having discriminatory laws on the books. So it kind of went both way. There was less of the positive and more of the negative in general in these majority rural states. Um, overall, uh, because of the, the smaller community, there's also uh, you know, fewer members and less support of members of the community also results in there being fewer uh, opportunities for members of the community to gain positions of any kind of power, especially political power. They simply are not going to have their own representation in a lot of these governmental structures. Um, so they're, they're not there to advocate for themselves and they're relying on outside members, people outside the community um, to hopefully take up some kind of uh, legislation or protection for the community. Um, so back, relating this back to, um, finding a career when you're a member of the community. I um, wanted to pull out, you know, I said I worked at Garden and it was great where I was in Pittsburgh. But 29% of gardens classify themselves as being located in rural or mixed immediate areas. So those areas we just talked about may present a lot of these challenges to members of the community. And 57% of gardens overall are in those majority rural states from that first map that I showed. So if I knew from the beginning I wanted to work in public gardens and was saying, where are all the jobs? What could I apply to to work in a garden? Over half of the garden would have become non-possibility for me because it was in a place that I felt I could not survive, live, thrive, and flourish. Thinking of some of the more traditional aspects, uh, IPM in agriculture, um, even IPM in, in other aspects of horticulture, whether, you know, field production or even cannabis. Um, a lot of that traditional agriculture takes place in these majority rural areas because it has just such an intensive space demand. Um, and that again relates to that overall map of those majority rural areas overall being less supportive and actually more discriminatory towards the community. So how would I think you know, everywhere I looked at, you know, you know, I loved being doing education and I was also looking at extension careers. So many of those were in these majority rural states because of just that's where the school is. So you're going to be interacting with people and living in these rural areas. And I said, I can't do that. As much as I love teaching and talking with people and solving problems and helping people, that's not going to be a place that I can be myself and live. Um, so, you know, I, you know, this question given all these barriers that I've discussed here, how can community members engage in careers in those places? How can those structures be built to support them and give members of the community the ability to pursue those careers without, you know, without deleting parts of their own map? How can people really be able to go wherever they want, wherever there is something that will be their passion, that will be fulfilling to them, that will help others, um, given all these barriers? Um, and so, you know, overall, you know, what, what I think the, certainly what the, the MAP the, uh, project uh, was, was talking about and what, what I'm trying to, you know, display here is that just like anybody, the members of our community just want a place to call home. Um, the, that project I discussed was it, was, it was focused on people who, members of the community who grew up in rural areas and wanted to stay there. And those were barriers they experienced even in deciding whether they could stay in the place that they've always called home or not. And I was coming at it from just the, can I move there to get a job or not? Which is far lower stakes than, can I stay in the place that I grew up in that I've always called home? And, and I just, I believe, you know, we should be working towards a point where no one should have to choose between being their, their basic right to protection um, and thriving and the place that they work or call home. Um, whether it is where they grew up or they're looking for work or they're moving because they're, you know, their significant other uh, found a job, um, we should be working to eliminate these kinds of barriers so that people can move anywhere, work anywhere, and really achieve the best for themselves and for society as a whole. Um, 
So what are some recommendations on these on next steps? Because again, these are these are huge questions. I don't have answers. I don't expect any of you to have answers. I expect that we need to work together in really big and often grassroots ways to try to come up with solutions for this. Um, so first and foremost, um, continue seeking to educate yourself. Um, and so that's again, thank you for even attending this talk, for putting in the time and the work to listen, to be open and to learn. Um, and so this education should be, you know, not, not only just about others and, and other kinds of communities you may not be part of, uh, but it's also self-education that we should all do um, on, uh, on things like biases that we may hold, uh, including unconscious biases. Because I'm not saying that anybody may intentionally hold negative views or anything like that. But we, our socialization as we grow up may just inherently introduce these kinds of unconscious biases into ourselves. And I'm, and I'm certainly not saying that I don't have biases either, everyone does. And it's all just about learning what they are. So if it ever creeps up into your thinking or something you're doing, you catch it and you stop it because you can question it. And so that's part of that education process as well. Um, and, and a lot of it is about putting that kind of work in on your own. Um, it's not trying to delegate that work to others to educate you and expect them to put work into you. It's really putting in the work yourself. Um, we also need to, you know, just like this series that I'm very happy to see is going on, this series of talks, we need to continue to include, listen to, and value diverse voices um, and make sure that they are truly being listened to and what and we are acting on things that come up. Um, so organizationally, this should be, you know, take the form of things like diversity and sensitivity consultants when you're thinking of programs or revamping a, a DEI or a DEIJ statement, um, or even making one if your organization doesn't have one. Um, and ensuring that uh, those people are always well compensated for their time and energy put into helping you. Um, it's too often that a lot of DEI things ends up being, we expect it to be, you know, pro bono or free or, um, you know, oh, we'll just put together a, a committee of people who already work here to come up with a solution to the problem. That's not going to work you, you, when you need that outside perspective and that expertise, people who there are, there's expertise on these things. Um, that you really, that you need to bring in and, and compensate for, for what they're bringing to the table for you. Um, we also need to, uh, if you don't have uh, an idea policy, which is what we call it in gardens, which that's DEI, DEIJ, um, develop and champion it, or if you already have it, really take up championing that policy. Um, and, and, and ask, you know, what are the real values of what we're doing here? And are we accurately reflecting that in our day-to-day -day operations, our processes, our programs, what are we doing? Are we really reflecting what we truly believe? Uh, because just the visibility of doing what you believe can even start to be that kind of wedge in making change. Um, and like I said, we're not gonna do, no one's gonna do this alone. So we need to find allies for this change in one another. Um, because that's gonna, that's gonna, like I mentioned that wedge, that's gonna increase the size and number of those wedges going into the brick wall of how things currently are to try to shift it in some way towards the way that we really wanna see a more equitable and just society. Um, and another aspect of that can just be being an advocate um, in your community, county, and at state and federal representation levels, you know, reaching out, even if there is not anything about a specific piece of legislation on the table or something, you reach out to your representative, write them a letter or something and, and, and express, this is something that I really care about that our state needs to be pursuing in a lot of different ways because they, are, they need to act according to the will of the people. So if you're not expressing that you want these kinds of things fixed and creating this you know, society for not only you know, this is the community I'm talking about today, but for all communities as a whole, we really need to make sure that that is happening um, up and down all the levels of, of these types of action. Um, so with that, you know, I just wanna say thank you again for a, attending this talk. Um, I know it was a lot of just story time for me, um, but I hope it just increased awareness and thinking um, around, around some of these things. So I just wanna say thank you again uh, for attending. Wonderful, well, thank you. That was really stimulating. 
it sure was for me anyway. Um, I don't see any questions, but I do have some comments. So um, somebody said, thank you for highlighting the landscape of fear that queer folks must navigate. This also uh, weighs on me as I look for jobs post PhD. Um, Sandy Feather said, uh, hi Ryan, uh, thanks for this presentation. As a gay woman in extension, the university does extend protections to our community and I'm pretty out with my colleagues, but I guarantee that I'm more circumspect with my rural colleagues. Um, and uh, Deb Grantham said, I really like the wedges in the brick and the wall metaphor. Um, uh, Mike Webb uh, said so many aha moments. Thanks for opening my lens more. Some of your points and comments were never even on my radar, being a white cisgender uh, female. Um, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that was from Jerry, <laughs> not Mike. Um, and, um, and someone did ask a question actually, um, how do institutions uh, do better at marketing communities that are safer within rural areas uh, where they have open positions? That's, so, I mean, that's a very good question. <laughs> and how do you, because even when you market those kinds of areas, um, you know, you're, you'd still be, uh, I'd still worry that you're, you're, you're marketing living in a, a tiny bubble they may not even be that great of a bubble. And what if that person needs to go and do anything anywhere else? Um, you know, if, if you say, oh, the, you know, the area around the university is really good, um, you know, but so does, does that mean I have five square miles to live my entire life that I can't go anywhere else? Um, so I, 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 I'm, I'm not saying that there, there aren't ways um, to, to really to create, you know, nice centers or, or, or hubs of, of, of poor people. Um, but that at the same time, we need that broader scale action that eventually you can pop that bubble and it, it doesn't matter anymore because the overall landscape is healthy and livable and, and accepting for everybody. Um, and so it's, you know, I, I, I think, you know, that's, I think that's a big part of that consideration. Um, and I'd say, you know, from my own personal experience, when I was thinking about you know, looking at jobs and, you know, grappling with, oh, well, this, you know, this isn't, a, you know, in a city in the state. So it, it looks like it leans more this way and it may be, you know, better for me there and, and on and on and on. Um, but then overall, looking at everything else around the state, I'd be living in, you know, this tiny little blip in the middle of a, of a huge state where everywhere else that I went, I would have to either not go or um, mask who I was and try to act very differently to try to stay safe. Um, and I, I, I just wasn't willing to do that. Um, and so I think, you know, it, pursuing that kind of question, um, the, the marketing of, of a community as, as a viable place um, that's where I think, you know, that's going to be a lot of work with people like the consultants that I mentioned, you know, what, what are the aspects, um, that actually do truly mean that is a, that it is a, a viable place for people to live, um, so that you can, you know, actually double check that not just, oh, it seems like it is, it's what is, what should really truly be in place? What is the history of it? Um, and, and using the, that expertise that is out there to make those kinds of determinations. Um, Cause you wouldn't want to falsely advertise a place that should be good for somebody when they arrive. It is not what their expectation is uh, of, what, of what that should mean coming from within a community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Lasani uh, Chochlian, I'm sorry if I've mangled the pronunciation there, has said, thank you so much for sharing. As a lesbian and a disabled person with a chronic illness, I think all the time about invisible and visible minorities and how the choice of disclosure for those of whom it's a choice is so difficult. Can you speak at all to times in your career when you have versus haven't disclosed and whether you've regretted either decision? That's a big question. That is, yeah, that's, that's a very big question. Um, 
I think overall, um, I was typically, I typically did not disclose as, as my personal preference. Um, and I'd say more, more so earlier, um, I am now far more open with it um, because I, you know, I now, I am now very comfortable in where I live in Pittsburgh. Um, and if it is, if my identity is ever going to come up as an issue with something within the city of Pittsburgh, um, you know, seeking employment somewhere or anything like that, um, I can immediately say, well, that's not a place I want to have anything to do with. And I know there's going to be other options for me. Um, so that it's that, that, you know, someone mentioned the, um, that overall like environment or landscape of fear that may exist. It's, you know, it's, those kinds of aspects and the trust you have in a place to develop a, a landscape of trust or of hope or of belief or of safety. Um, and so I become much more open about that now. Um, and, and so it's, I'd say, yeah, before, it, for me, it had a lot to do with the uncertainty of, of the reaction, which I know people from any, who have any kind of identity where it is, you know, ridiculously expected that we need to reveal that in coming out in some way um, when, you know, nobody comes out as being straight. Um, it, it turns, it, it is, it's very much about how comfortable you feel in where you are. Um, and so that is something that, you know, every time, even every time I've moved, that has to redevelop in, in how do I feel and where I am and that security that I feel. So I think that's, that's how I've always been navigating that. Thank you. Um, so Deb Grantham said, um, I have a very different reason for limitation. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Let me start again. I have a very different reason for limitations on where I can live. I'm a caregiver for, for family member with mental illness, but eliminating and choosing places that provide adequate services and has an accepting community is stifling at the least and very discouraging for sure. I have a sense of what you have to go through and it's just wrong. So that's it. Yeah, I'm yeah, I I'm I'm very sorry to hear that. Um and um uh, somebody else has said, uh, what are your thoughts on diversity statements in job applications? Sometimes it feels like we queer other marginalized folk have to capitalize on the things which we're persecuted for. Is there a better way? Mm. Let's see. Yeah. Um, diversity statements are, it's the sort of thing where, you know, a place not having a diversity statement is a red flag, but then simply the inclusion of a diversity statement is not a green flag. Um, it, it's, because a lot of times it, it does, it is lip service, which is why I mentioned so much about being sure that you are championing those kinds of policies in your institution. Um, because I think it, it, that, that should be, that should really, it should be at the forefront of, you know, what a managing, uh, a hiring manager should be able to discuss. Um, and so that you, um, can know that that is really integrated in what they do so that you know um, that it simply means you're going to be accepted for who you are and thought of as on the same level as everybody else, no, no matter, you know, what, what identity uh, or identities that you hold. Um, and, and I think that, you know, the, the question mentioned about, um, having to, you know, capitalize on that. That is it, is the, is the diversity statement something that, is it trying to prompt people to reveal that they ha hold some kind of certain identity because maybe you'll fill a checkbox for them. Um, and with, and, and that's, that's really hard. Um, and I don't think we're, we're not through those kinds of questions yet. Um, I think we're we're even still just working on the step of getting places to develop idea or DEI statements. Um, 
And you know, there, there are still places that, that do not have any kind of statement or policy. Um, and so it's, it, I think it's still the pushing of making sure that people have that and that it's also truly championed and, and, and believed um, by everybody because it, up until then, it, up until that point, um, you know, it, it's a constant uncertainty when you go into a job. I you know I certainly, even if there is a, a, a statement like that, um, I, you know, I often use very vague terms about anything that they ask me about my personal life. Um, you know, it's, I have a partner. I use completely non-gendered words. Um, and, and it revolves around not knowing the truth behind that diversity statement. Um, so I think that that is where there's a lot of work to, to, to be done. Um, and so I don't really have a good answer for that question because I think it is, it is what we are like currently embroiled in. Right. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and uh, we, I have one more question if you have time for that. Yeah. Um, uh, what advice uh, would you give to managers who are hiring interviewing for positions and would like to establish a culture of diversity and, uh, and inclusion? Mm. I think, you know, kind of what we just discussed that it's having, having a statement, but truly championing it. Um, and, and knowing that it's, that's not going to take an effect overnight. Um, so, you know, the advice I'd have is it, it needs to be a long show that it's a long-term commitment so that it is known, um, by people, you know, we, we know our professional communities and people talk, people have discussions. We, we know who does certain kinds of research or, you know, is a specialist in this or that. Um, and so it's establishing that you, that you championing that. And, and so it, it, it's a longer process. Um, I think the diversity statement is the way people think they can just say, okay, we made the change. There it is. And it's, it, cause when you, when you speak about the other aspect of, because we have that culture, culture is a, a very large thing that takes a lot of time to change and move. Um, there, there's a lot of, you know, organizational behavior theory around that change of culture. Um, and it is a, it has to be a systemic holistic process. And so it is, is going to take a lot of time, um, a lot of discussion. Um, I think oftentimes can be kind of painful. Um, if you're really championing that sort of thing, I think, you know, you have to also be willing to, people may leave. They don't, they don't believe in what you're trying to do. And you have to ask yourself, you know, is that worth it in order to build that culture? And so it is, it's a very long-term process. Um, and so it, it, it starts with, it starts with your actions today is really what I can say. Um, your, your actions and your words and your, um, and what you pursue today is what is going to begin changing or, or establishing um, your own internal culture so that that becomes known. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for some great questions and, uh, and comments. And, um, and thank you, uh, Ryan, for your thoughtfulness and, uh, and your openness. Uh, so we have some questions for you again. Uh, the similar ones are in, in some cases the same as we had at the beginning, and I'd appreciate if you could complete those. I'll just be quiet for a moment while folks do that. Great, I will share the results. So, um, and knowledge of careers in IPM, moderately and very knowledgeable, so that's definitely shifted. Um, and the challenges for the community, I think that's also shifted from the beginning. Um, and, um, and how likely are you to take into account the needs of the community? That has also very much uh, shifted from the beginning. And, um, and then um, that we had uh, 31 and 62%, so over 90% of people said that they see several uh, or many um, changes that they can, they can uh, take into account uh, when uh, thinking of uh, DIJ in the community. And, um, and how likely are you to revisit 
um, your institution's DIJ statement and policy, and there's also a big shift in that. So thank you for your attentiveness, your listening, and your integration of uh, Ryan's material. So, um, and if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, we have an upcoming webinar next week um, on language justice, which I think will be absolutely fascinating. Uh, same time, 11 o'clock next Wednesday. And next June, uh, we are planning um, an LGBTQ in IPM Northeast Roundtable discussion. Uh, the date for that isn't thoroughly set, but it'll be the latter part of, of June. And, um, and uh, the two facilitators here are Mary Centrella and Kim Skirm. And um, if you have any suggestions of people who would be great to include in that round uh, table discussion, please contact uh, Mary Centrella, because um, I'm sure she's, I know she's still looking for a couple of people to include. And uh, next slide, please. Um, if you would like to connect with colleagues um, in IPM and around these issues, you can post a profile on our website and you can also uh, go to find a colleague um, and to, uh, to, uh, to connect with people who have posted profiles. And the next slide, please. Uh, recording will uh, be here next week, and I will send you an email with a copy of the recording. And the next slide, please. I want to acknowledge uh, that we receive our funding from USDA NIFA, and uh, without their funding, we wouldn't be able to, uh, to do these webinars and all the other work that we do at the center. So I appreciate and acknowledge and thank uh, USDA for their funding. And next slide, please. Uh, the Northeastern IPM Center is based at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono Nation. The Gayakono are members of the Hodo Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gayakono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. This acknowledgement has been reviewed and approved by the traditional Gayakono leadership. So with that, um, I will uh, say thank you very much. If you want to end the slideshow, Ryan, um, I appreciate um, your speaking today, the thoughtfulness that's gone into it the life that you have led and are leading that um, that uh, contributes to it and your um, your education, your background, everything. And um, I appreciate your uh, generosity in uh, speaking so clearly and so thoughtfully and being willing to share it in a way that I think has been very stimulating for everyone who's been here today and everyone who will watch the recording. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Yana. Okay. All right. Goodbye. Bye-bye.